The day the world chose the mark of the beast. Revelation chapter 13, verses 15 through 18. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred threescore and six. In the 18th verse of the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation, the Bible clearly states that 666 is the number of a man. The Word of God wants you to know that the Antichrist is a man and not an angel. He is a man and not a system. He is a man and not a government. He is a man and not an institution. He is a man and not an organization. He is a man and not an establishment. He is a man and not a secret society. He is a man and not a spirit being. He is a man and not a force. He is a man and not an idea. He is a man and not a theology. He is a man and not a movement or force. No, the Word of God wants to make it clear that you know when we talk about the Antichrist, we are talking about a man and what a man he will be. The Bible describes this man as the beast of the sea. This symbolic description of the Antichrist as the beast of the sea reveals a tremendous amount about his nature, his origin, and his character. It is interesting to see that although the Antichrist is a man, God does not view him as a man made in the divine image of God, but rather God views him as a beast, as a wild animal, under the control of the dragon, Satan. We see in the second verse of the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation who gave the Antichrist his power. Revelation chapter 13 verse 2, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. It is Satan who gave him his power and great authority. Many people grossly underestimate the power and authority Satan has. First, let's establish something important. The Bible often refers to Satan as the God of this age. We see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, or in the prince of the power of the air. We see this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. These designations give insight to Satan's temporary authority and influence in the earthly realm. John's epistle even asserts 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. These passages together suggest that Satan does have some measure of authority over the kingdoms of this world, at least for a season. Now, when Jesus was offered these kingdoms, it wasn't because Satan had ultimate ownership over them. Rather, it's because in the fallen state of the world, Satan has been allowed a temporary rulership. But Jesus, recognizing the deceptive nature of the offer and the requirement to worship Satan, declined, quoting scripture in response, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. As previously stated, scripture states that the dragon, another name for Satan, will give his power, throne, and great authority to the Antichrist in Revelation chapter 13, verse 2. The Antichrist will be energized by the very power of hell. God does not view the Antichrist, who is the beast from the sea, and the false prophet, the beast from the earth, as men made in the divine image of God. Instead, God views them as beasts, as wild animals, under the control of the dragon, Satan. This is so important, and it sheds light on the fact that all other human beings who have lived and do not accept Christ will be judged at the great white throne judgment. Revelation chapter 20 verses 11 through 15. However, only two human beings, 
only two unredeemed human beings miss out on this great white throne judgment, the Antichrist and the false prophet. They are not even judged. They are directly cast into the lake of fire. This should show you that these two people are not normal individuals. These two people will be fueled by a level of evil unlike the world has ever seen before. Revelation chapter 20 verse 10, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. The Antichrist will be evil like no other. Just as Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, so the beast will be Satan in a human body, and he has the number 666. Anytime you see the number 666, you need to be aware and cautious, for that is not a number you want to be associated with. Many rock bands and media outlets play with the number 666, but that number is something you should not want anything to do with. I remember a few decades ago, I bought a phone and three of the numbers in that mobile number were 666. I said, no thank you, sir, and called the provider to get that number changed. Imagine being a pastor, handing out your number to people and then saying 666. That is not a good look. Never have anything to do with that number, for it is the number of a man. It is the number of a beast. Now today, I want to talk about the day the world chose the mark of the beast. In the panorama of biblical prophecy, one of the most riveting scenes is undoubtedly when the mark of the beast is introduced and accepted. The world will choose the mark of the beast, just the same way the world chose to reject the Lord Jesus Christ. This stark and chilling moment in future history is more than just an end time spectacle. It holds a profound mirror to humanity's choices and allegiances. Choices have consequences, and we are all given a choice. Choices have consequences. Remember that the beast is a counterfeit Christ. It's crucial to understand this. The Antichrist is Satan's master, attempt to mock, mimic, and malign the genuine Savior, Jesus Christ. Satan has always been about imitation, albeit a twisted one. Just as false coinage reveals the value of true currency, so the appearance of the Antichrist underscores the value and verity of Jesus Christ. However, here's the bitter irony. This world would not receive the true Jesus Christ, but it will receive the Antichrist. It's a choice that resonates with profound consequences. Choices have consequences. Each and every one of us, when we are born in this life, is given the option to make choices, and our choices bear eternal consequences. Not a single one of us will cease to exist 100 years from now, or a thousand years from now, or even a million years from now. The choices we make are eternal. Choices have consequences. We live in a world that attempts to sugarcoat, a world that tries to blur the lines, a world that tries to hide the fact that choices have consequences. Although the mark of the beast is not in operation today, you and I have a choice to make. It's either Jesus Christ or the Antichrist. In one way or another, there's no middle ground. The days the world rejected Christ is when the world tacitly, perhaps unknowingly, accepted the Antichrist and the markings of his dominion. The day the world chose the mark of the beast was not a sudden leap into darkness, but a culmination of many choices made in rejection of the light of the world. You see, if we reject Jesus Christ, it's almost inevitable that we'll accept the Antichrist. One can't simply remain neutral in matters of eternal significance. When Jesus proclaimed, he who is not with me is against me, he presented a dichotomy that stands true even in end time scenarios. When we push away truth, there's only one thing left to embrace, deception. There's no middle ground. When we push away truth, there's only one thing left to embrace, deception. There is no middle ground. And how this world has pushed away the truth that is the Lord Jesus Christ. The world rejected the truth of Jesus Christ, but tragically, the world will believe the lie of the Antichrist. It's as if humanity's spiritual compass, having lost its true north, will be all too willing to follow a false magnetic pull, and how this false magnetic pull will come. 
The world will have never seen one like the Antichrist. People will love him and worship him, and those who do not love him and worship him will be coerced into worshiping him. Furthermore, consider the depths of deception. The world will not worship Christ, the one who bore their sins, the one who wore the crown of thorns and extended grace freely. Yet they will bow down to the Antichrist, the embodiment of everything opposed to grace, love, and truth. It reminds me of Jesus' words in John chapter 5, verse 43. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me. But if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. The essence of this verse highlights how choices have consequences. Choices can either lead to life or usher in calamity, particularly eternal calamity. The world's choice to reject Jesus Christ, God incarnate, the embodiment of love, grace, and truth, opens the door for a substitute that is a polar opposite, the Antichrist, who embodies hatred, lawlessness, and deception. The day the world chose the mark of the beast won't merely be a day of temporal consequence. It will reveal the eternal consequence of the choices humans have been making all along. By rejecting Christ, humanity essentially leaves a void. Nature abhors a vacuum, and so does the spiritual realm. That void will be filled by the one who comes in his own name. Unlike Jesus who came to do the will of his Father, the Antichrist will come to do his own will and, by extension, the will of Satan, the father of lies. The Antichrist will not point people to God. Rather, he will point people to himself and demand worship for himself. The world will be so deceived that it will believe this to be a reasonable and necessary act. The acceptance of the Antichrist and his mark will be the culmination of humanity's choices against God, a climax of rebellion, a pinnacle of collective delusion. The day the world chose the mark of the beast will be a day marked by unprecedented spiritual blindness, a blindness that could have been avoided had the world accepted Jesus, the light of the world. The Antichrist's dominion will be unlike anything the world has ever seen. His empire will stretch across continents, engulfing nations and cultures from the east to the west, north to the south. No corner of the earth will remain untouched by his pervasive influence. His reign will bring with it a unity of control where every political, economic, and social system bends to his will. People from diverse backgrounds, languages, and beliefs will find themselves under the shadow of his omnipresent authority. Technology, trade, and communication channels will be wielded as instruments of his dominance, ensuring that resistance is quelled and conformity is enforced. This unparalleled global rule will consolidate power in his hands, making him not just a political leader, but a force that seeks to dictate the very conscious and soul of humanity. In conclusion, while the Antichrist will have his temporary moment, the eternal victory belongs to Jesus Christ. So as we study prophecy and look ahead to what's coming, let's also examine our hearts today. Let our choices reflect our allegiance to the true Christ and not be swayed by the world's ever-increasing deceptions. For in understanding the counterfeit, we can more deeply appreciate, honor, and commit to the genuine Savior. Matthew 24 verses 1 to 14 And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, and pestilences, and earthquakes in divers places. 
All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. When reflecting upon the teachings of Jesus in Matthew 24, 1-14, and comparing them to the current state of the world, it becomes evident that we are witnessing the very unfolding of his prophetic words. Jesus provided an overview of world conditions that would mark the interim between his ascension and the days leading up to his second coming. His descriptions, though broad, resonate profoundly with our current world today. It's almost as if we're being handed a spiritual lens, allowing us to view our world through the prophetic revelations of Jesus. As we match up current events with his words, it becomes clear we are moving closer to the fulfillment of Matthew 24, 1-14. Wars and rumors of wars switch on the news and the reports are flooded with nations rising against nations. Kingdoms are in conflict with kingdoms. Famine. Global reports show that many regions are struggling with food scarcity and malnutrition. Earthquakes. Seismic activities are becoming more frequent, with tremors shaking parts of the world that were once considered stable. Yet, it's crucial to understand that none of these isolated events singularly indicate the imminent return of Christ. Instead, they collectively paint a larger picture. When Jesus termed these events as the beginning of sorrows, he was providing a vivid illustration. The original phrase can be likened to the beginning of labor pains. Anyone familiar with birth understands the nature of contractions. They start off mild, then grow in frequency and intensity as birth nears. Drawing this parallel, we shouldn't be looking for one monumental event signaling Jesus' return. Rather, the increasing frequency and intensity of wars, famines, earthquakes and other tragedies serve as collective indications. Just as contractions point towards an impending birth, these events signify that creation is groaning, eagerly awaiting the second coming of Christ. What you as a child of God need to look out for is frequency and intensity. Frequency and intensity. This perspective is essential in our interpretation. While it's easy to look at one significant event and declare, this is the sign. Jesus encourages a broader view. Collectively, these are signs. They represent the beginning of sorrows, and like early labor pains, they prepare us for what's ahead. Moreover, the significance lies not just in recognizing these signs, but in the heart posture they encourage. If we truly believe that we're living in the beginning of sorrows, it should instill an urgency in our hearts, an urgency that time is running out, an urgency to seek the Lord while he may be found. An urgency to understand that we are moving closer and closer to the book of Revelation. An urgency to spread the gospel, to deepen our relationship with Jesus, and to be ambassadors of his peace in an increasingly tumultuous world. Time and time again, we need to remind ourselves, we are literally living in the beginning of sorrows. The beginning of sorrows is no longer a prophecy. No, they are here. The days you live in are the beginning of sorrows. The days you live in are the end of days. The days you live in are prophetic. The days you live in are a crossroads of eternity. The days you live in are the unfolding of revelation. The days you live in are the testament of truth foretold. The days you live in are the final pages of earthly history. Each headline, every tragedy, and all the global disruptions shouldn't push us to fear, 
but to a deeper faith. It's a call to understand the times and recognize God's sovereign hand guiding world events. Do not be surprised at what is happening in our world. Jesus told us this will happen. Yes, the sorrows are real. The pain, suffering and chaos are palpable. But let them serve as a reminder that these are but the beginnings. Just as labor pains ultimately culminate in the joy of new birth, these sorrows point to the hope of Jesus' return and the establishment of his eternal kingdom. It is easy to look out into the world and believe that everything is out of control. But I would like to remind you, my friend, we serve a living God, a sovereign God. Everything is not out of control. He works all things after the counsel of his own will. God is in charge. Jesus made it clear that all the things listed in Matthew 24 will be part of the last days, the perilous times. You are constantly hearing rumors of wars. You are constantly hearing about people dying and you don't know what to do. You feel like you are not safe. You feel like you cannot bear these evils in the world anymore. You feel as if the world and its rulers are getting more and more wicked by the day. Jesus said you should not be discouraged because of this. He said you should not be troubled. No matter what happens in this world, no matter what the government does in the country you live in, don't be discouraged. Don't live in fear. Remember that God is still on his throne. And as long as God is still on his throne, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to live in fear. God is watching you. Everything you say, everything you do, God is watching you. Every move you make, every step you take, God is watching you. Not one second passes where God does not have his eyes on you. God is watching you. Wherever you are right now and whatever you are doing, know this. God is watching you. Typically, when I say this to people, they get nervous. They become afraid and apprehensive. But the problem is that they still view God not as a father, but as someone they are at enmity with. If you are born again, the fact that God is watching you should not bring fear into your heart, but it should give you peace. A peace that surpasses all understanding. A peace that does not come from this world. You are no longer at enmity with God because of the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. No man has ever loved you like the Lord Jesus loves you. He died for you. He experienced the most profound death for you. He gave his life for you. And now, this very second, he is the one seated at the right hand of the Father and he is advocating for us. It is all about the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for you, what he did for his bride. Now, as we know, the Bible tells us that we are living in the end of days. We are truly in the 11th hour and the 59th minute of human civilization. We can see everything that Jesus told us would happen in Matthew 24 is happening now. A perfect example of God still is in control his scene in Daniel. Daniel 4, 24 to 27. This is the interpretation, your majesty, and this is the decree the Most High has issued against my Lord the King. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. Can you imagine that? Nebuchadnezzar was a king who often took glory and adoration for his empire under his rule, the Babylonian Empire was one of the most powerful kingdoms in the world and Babylon grew into a formidable city. Nebuchadnezzar was as high as a human being could get. Everyone and everything was below him. 
He had so many resources at his disposal, and he received glory and adoration for this. As far as Nebuchadnezzar was concerned, there was no one higher than him. But God humbled this man, and for seven years he was put on his hands and knees, and had to eat grass like a wild animal. This isn't even the impressive part. The context is that when this happened, Israel was still under the rulership of his empire. But God reduced the emperor to show that he is still in charge. Nebuchadnezzar was known as the destroyer of nations, but he was reduced to eating grass. I say all this to highlight the fact that God is still in control, regardless of what direction the world takes. We have a God in heaven who is large and in charge, Regardless of who sits in the seat of authority on this earth, ultimately God is in control. And the God who is in control is the God who is watching you. You don't have to live in fear. In your own life, whatever direction your life takes, remember God is still in control. It doesn't matter who has betrayed you. It may even be your wife or husband who has betrayed you. But remember, God is still in control. Joseph was betrayed by his brothers, but who was in control? God. Isn't it wonderful that God is watching you? The one who is ultimately in control is interested in your life and your family's life. The one who loves you is interested in your life. What more does he have to do to show you he loves you? He is the reason you are going to heaven. You are not going to heaven because you are a good person. There are plenty of good people in hell right now. Being a good moral person does not get you one second in heaven. You are not going to heaven because of the amount of money you have given. You are not going to heaven because of the number of people you have helped. Your last name, the amount of time you pray, won't do anything for you. The number of church services you attend won't help you. The real reason you are going to heaven is because of one man who came to this earth 2,000 years ago and died for your sins, for my sins, for our sins. We deserved hellfire. We deserved eternal destruction. We deserved to experience the full wrath of God without limit. We deserved to be in that place where the rich man went in the story of the rich man and Lazarus. We deserved to go to that place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. But the Bible tells us in John 3:16, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It is the love of God that saved us from that place. It is the love of God that saved us from the eternity of hell. Jesus came and paid the price. Too often, we open the news and see all the things happening in the world, and all we see is perilous times. I am here to just remind you that God is in control. You don't have to be afraid or live in fear. The one who is ultimately in control is watching over you. As the beginning of sorrows unfolds, don't be afraid. Know that you serve a living God.